David change his name, please. So yeah. thank you everybody for attending today. My name is Brent Hoover. I am the area manager for the Aiken office of the SPDC. And today we are naturally discussing cybersecurity. This is functioning as our cybersecurity roundtable. For those of you who may not know, October is the month for cybersecurity awareness. We only thought it was appropriate to conduct our next session today. Now, for those of you who actually attended our prior cyber discussion with Colonel Carl Young back in July, this is a follow-up discussion to that prior seminar. We have a great group of panelists. We're really looking at showing the application of how a cyber attack could apply to a small business owner such as yourself. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please, Sarah. So naturally, this is conducted by the SPDC, so we do have to give ourselves a plug on this. So who are we? Well, we are funded by the SBA to offer economic assistance, not money, but offering startup assistance, loan assistance, government contracting, and some cyber awareness, as you'll find out, to various for-profit businesses around the state. So our mission is obviously to improve the economy of our area. So as you can see here, we are not just here based in Aiken, we are across the state. State has their own SBDC, but we are a separate entity from other states. As you can see here, we've got various programs. We've got over 46 consultants across the area. And yes, we do tag team additionally on client calls. So as you can see, also we do operate under the SBA standards. We are completely no cost. We are completely confidential. However, we do require our clients to post metrics. We never release them individually, but we aggregate them. And that's how we're able to show our return on our investment. Now, I do want to ask that everybody who is present, would you mind typing your name into the chat box? That way we're actually able to show attendance. So therefore, we get credit for having you attend. And thus, we're able to continue showing value as we move forward with these types of events. Next slide. So as you can see here, this is dealing with our scope of services. You know, here in Aiken, we focus a lot on startup assistance, business plans, loan packaging. But as you can see here, we have specialists in every different area, whether that be marketing, looking at employees, Scott Bellows, who is one of our panelists today. He is one of our contracting experts, certainly. Earl Gregorich as well has a focus with the veterans. And as you can see here, we also have access to a multitude of resources and referrals. We cannot give legal advice. We can't give tax advice, but we can surely connect you with those professionals that do just that. Next slide. Now, we, as we mentioned, we have a cybersecurity team. So this initially came out of our tech committee, but we said, you know, we want to get involved with this. We'd seen what other SBDCs have done, such as Delaware. And we thought this would be a great new scope of service to offer to our clients. As you can see here, the man himself, Earl Gregorich, is our team lead. He's going to be chiming in throughout today's discussion. All I'm serving is an MC today. I'm going to be navigating the discussion as we have 90 minutes and we have a lot to go through. But you can also see Bess Smith, a great asset to the SBDC, longtime consultant. And additionally, Scott Bells, as I mentioned, our contracting guru. And also, but certainly not least, Sherry as well as contracting. And we do have Mallory. Mallory is focusing on marketing, and she's also going to be handling multiple of the questions today. So anytime you have a question, let it know in the chat box, and she's going to relay those to me as we move along in our discussion. So as we deal with cyber issues going forward with debuting our program, now I do want to make the disclaimer that we are not guaranteeing anything of protecting you against a hack. Unfortunately, there's always the systemic risk that no matter how well we prepare, there's always that chance. However, our goal is to mitigate that risk as much as possible, educating the client on cyber awareness, cyber hygiene. There's a new model that's debuting. It's the cyber maturity model certification. It starts at level one in basic cyber hygiene. And that's what we're trying to make all of our clients aware of as we move forward. So if you are an existing SBDC client, this is who you probably are gonna to need to get in touch with if you're interested about cybersecurity awareness for your small business. So we have the group of contacts and we will have Earl and my contacts directly at the end. However, we'll be happy to connect you with any member of the team. I wanna just say thanks for all the hard work that they have put in throughout this initiative. Next slide. So we have a group of panelists. We have not only small business owners, but we have a group of experts that are coming from third parties. So who are they? You may remember Colonel Carl Young, if you were on our last call, with Fort Gordon coming in from the Army National Guard. We also have the legal perspective with Jim Denning from 
uh, Burr, Foreman, McNair. We have Earl himself, who will be acting as a go-to between the panelists and the small business. We also have David Johnson and Scott Reed. So we have a good group of them, and I would like for them to take a moment, three sentences at most right now, just so they can introduce themselves quickly, and you're going to be hearing through from them throughout the discussion. So, Colonel, let's start with you. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm Carl Young, a 26-year Army veteran uh, serving in the National Guard as an active duty member at the Cyber Center of Excellence. Uh, I'm a signal officer, uh, a systems engineer, and a cyber officer. So we'll follow on as, as Brent talked about going from the cyber maturity management uh, certification levels one and two that we talked about in June and hopefully kind of explore some new avenues to better posture you for safety. Thank you. Thanks, Colonel. Jim? Okay, three sentences. N not doable for a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm Jim Denning. I practice law through my own firm, J. Denning Law. Um, and I've been practicing in the data privacy and data breach realm for several years. You may have noticed or may note on the slide that uh, my firm is, is uh, listed as being Burr Foreman McNair. I want to let you know that I left Burr about a month ago to open my own shop uh, on good terms. And I also want to let you know that Burr has a great cybersecurity team if you need heavy lifting, uh, need, a, need a group of people to, to assist you uh, from the legal side. Doug Lineberry, who many of you may know, acts as the gatekeeper in South Carolina for businesses that are seeking cybersecurity help from Burr and Foreman. So uh, you can contact me, you can contact Burr, you'll get, uh, you'll get good appropriate service either, either way. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Earl? I'm Earl Gravich. I'm the area manager for the Greenville area up in the Clemson area. And uh, I'm here to help with the business type of questions today. Happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Earl, as always. David. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm David Johnson. I'm the director of network engineering with the Medion. I've been with Medion for about 12 years now. We're a infrastructure as a service companies. We have nine data centers uh, from Columbus, Indiana to Charleston, South Carolina work with uh, primarily small to medium-sized businesses meeting the uh, physical and cybersecurity needs as well as managed services and other IT consulting. Great and last but not least Scott. Scott Reed. Hey Scott you're on. Sorry had it on mute. Uh, good on morning mute. my name is Scott Reed. I'm the uh, National Director for uh, Arthur J. Gallagher for our uh, Affinity Cyber Insurance Programs, and I'm responsible for working with approximately 50 different small business associations who endorse a cyber insurance program, and I help coordinate uh, their response when they do have a, uh, a data breach or cyber attack, and those associations represent about 2 million small businesses, so we've seen a lot of uh, breaches against small businesses and what I'm here today to talk about is the role that cyber insurance can play and uh, some of the experiences that these small businesses have had with uh, with data breaches. Thank you so much Scott. So as you can see we had the introductions from our panelists but also to joining us are the various small business owners some of our clients who have been willing to go public about the issues that they have faced so let's actually get a quick rundown of who they will be. Next slide please. So those contributing owners are the following. We have Karen, we have Aaron, Annie, Alicia, and Jody. And I had the pleasure of actually editing the videos that they had submitted to Earl and Scott. And that video is what we're going to illustrate to show the context and allow them to share their stories. Now, after the video plays, we're also going to talk with them both informally on an individual level, what they've learned from the experience. And we'll allow a panelist to look through and see from their expertise, what may they could have done in the instead of that, and also too, what can they do moving forward? So we wanna say great thanks to them for being willing here on camera, not only for the video, but also too, to contribute to the discussion. Next slide, please. Now with that said, I'm gonna turn the ball over to Earl because he wants to talk about soft targets, why you're vulnerable, and what the value that you created, and how you can protect that of your company. Earl? Thank you, Brent. So yeah, one of the things we want to establish up front is uh, obviously the reason why we're all here today is uh, small businesses. We tend to 
uh, be a target without acknowledging the fact that we are a target. And one of the, some of the reasons that we are a target, we, we don't typically have the resources or the expertise to invest in cybersecurity. So we have no or limited cybersecurity in place in most of our businesses. Uh, so that makes us vulnerable. We also have very desirable data that uh, the, 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 the black market, so to speak, or the, the black web, dark web that, we're that we hear so much about is valuing and the things like credit card data, medical data, personal information, to personal identity. Uh, all of these things are very valuable to the hacker market. So uh, because we have no security and we have that, that highly desirable data, we become a target. And then, of course, uh, the, the, one of the primary reasons we're, we're talking about some of the standardized approaches to cybersecurity today, uh, we're actually part of the food chain for many of the larger organizations, the major corporations and some of the government entities out there rely on us to supply goods and services. And in doing so, we are exchanging data and we are hooking to their networks. So we really need to be in a position where we are protecting what we have and uh, conducting good cybersecurity hygiene. So that's why we're being targeted. We have the connections, we have the data, and we really don't have the protections for the most part. Next slide. So with all that said, what we want to get to focus on as a small business owner is not necessarily the cyber security aspect of it, but the fact that you have worked really hard to build a value in your business. And that is easy to see when we talk about assets and market presence and, and a book of client names and so on. But sometimes we fail to attach the value that's associated with the data and the digital reputation that we carry within our business. And that's really what we're talking about. How do we protect that value, that value that really represents a large portion of that bottom line dollar amount that we might someday want to extract from that business? Back to you, Brent. Great. Thank you. So as you can see, we're going to be operating under two models. Now you may have heard of them, the NIST and the CMMC. Now they are different things coming from different organizations. However, they're following the same fundamentals. That is basic cyber hygiene. As you can see here with the NIST model, we've got identity, protect, detect, respond, and recover. However, CMMC actually puts it into a better sense of 17 different standards that we can look at for basic cyber hygiene. Next slide, please. As you can see here, there are five levels. So this is being debuted by the Department of Defense. Now, it's not active just yet. However, we are seeing it come in. Therefore, we do want to make people aware of it. There's a lot of discussion about cyber out there. So we are asking people to say, hey, let's look at this one particular model. And as I was mentioning, here's the basic cyber hygiene down there. And that is something that we are going to be debuting, trying to make our clients aware of the different standards and how to actually ensure that those standards are active for their company. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned, there's a video that we are going to debut. So with that said, Sarah, let's roll it. Well, hindsight being 2020, when it comes to cybersecurity, cheapest is not the best way to go. My name is Annie Richardson, and the name of the business is AFR Safety Resources. My name is Jody Lynch. I have Southern Safety Group. We're a small security and investigation company. My name is Alicia Reese, founder of Reese Business Solutions. I'm located in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, I'm Karen Jenkins, the owner of KRJ Consulting. We're a small 8A woman-owned small business uh, founded in 2008, based in Columbia, South Carolina. First breach was uh, actually uh, my website was seized. This is going to be kind of funny considering that this is the, the way that we're going with this whole entire topic, but my background was I was a criminal investigator. I worked for the sheriff's office, I worked for the city police, I was a supervisor and I worked organized crime. ISIS sympathizers, they put some little flag up on the website explaining who they were and uh, that they had hacked me and uh, Basically, I was held hostage until I could get GoDaddy to uh, get the count unfrozen for me and pay some more money on, for security on top of that. The one in December, I had a contracting, what appeared to be a contracting officer reach out to me to say they wanted us to provide them with the monitors. It, it was odd that it was, you know, this one particular contract is when it started happening. You know, did the normal procurement. It came from U.S. transportation. He had a U.S. Uh, 
uh, transportation email address. He had a Washington, D.C. Uh, phone number. Uh, he asked me for a quote. I provided him with a quote. Uh, he had the legitimate looking forms. He sent them back to me and said, yes, we, we've chosen you. We want you to provide it. Here's the address. Here's the purchase order. Um, it's going to be shipped to our warehouse. Anybody can be hacked and for any reason, and you may not know it, and it may be going on for some time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much, un, you know, just it, it, it unshovels you. It puts you in a position of distrust for everybody around you. I have used Yahoo uh, as my personal email. I've had that email for about 15 years. Uh, the, the first thing was I found out that I had a more antiquated system uh, that my email was set up on. And uh, the reason I hadn't changed was because it was cheap. <laughs> and even sitting at the computer, I could be sitting down and I could see my cursor moving on its own. Somebody had accessed my email and they had gone in and had all of my military emails going to an RSS feed. I had an ad block on it because, of course, you know, nobody wants to look at the ads all day long. And when I went to look, uh, look at my email, I got this big old block uh, that was on, uh, that blocked all of my email, basically telling me that in order for me to get the rest of my email, um, that I will have to pay. Here's the two things that happened. They sent an email from me to one of my clients that said, hey, look, we have an issue with this invoice. We want you to change it and, and send the money someplace else. Thank goodness the persons that they sent it to don't even do anything with invoices. My subcontractor, my largest subcontractor, um, I got an email from their accounting person that said, hey, Karen, we're not using so-and-so bank anymore. We're now using... I think it was Chase, and we want you to send it to this number, this routing number, this account number. So I'm like, mm, first of all, you know, the radar goes up. First of all, the young lady that sent me that information, that information wouldn't have come from her. It would have come from her boss. And it wouldn't have come just in an email. So I sent, I took the email and I forwarded it to her boss and her and said, I need verbal confirmation via a phone call. And, and also for you to look at this and confirm that this is you and it's, it's the case immediately. Nope, not us. I tell people that I always thought my life and my life work was as boring as watching wet paint dry. But somebody has an interest. Somebody is interested in what you're doing. So I opened up my, my business. We're small. So I, I'm on top of my, my checking accounts and everything else. Pretty, pretty tight. And I finally called my bank and I said, well, you know what? I got to get my email. I'm going to go ahead and pay this. And it was only $3.49, $3.49 cents a month. But if you think if there are millions of other paying such a small amount, somebody's making a killer. I get a phone call at 2.15 in the morning from Wells Fargo saying, hey, are you by chance in Virginia at a bar spending $2,000? And I was like, well, no, I'm in South Carolina in bed, not spending $2,000 at a bar. It's been pretty close, close to, um, you know, three to $4,000. I actually uh, transferred funds out and thank God got them back. And uh, the GoDaddy assured me, said, okay, now that you got this, you won't get hacked anymore. Well, that did not solve it. And today I'm still paying the $3.49. And I promise you, if I put a stop on that, I won't get my email. But if I wasn't a small company, it would probably be a long period of time before I've realized, and who knows how much money would actually come out of my account. So I tell people, you know, all the time, being a criminal investigator and still doing investigations and everything else, I tell people, make sure you stay on top of what's coming in and out of your account. Make sure that you guys do, um, you know, spot audits because you never know what other little companies are out there. And, and you know, their their job is nothing but to steal from from the hardworking business people. Yeah, but I was using something like malware uh, bytes, uh, use the paid version so that you're being updated you know, constantly and not having to rely upon yourself. So we have found some additional cybersecurity training that we've taken our entire team through. Uh, we've added additional precautions and protocols. We have a automatic renewing of passwords. We didn't have that before. Um, you have to change your password with us every 90 days. Um, 
you have to um, secure your information all the time. And really it's about the, the, the resources that are trying to penetrate our, our business and our efforts. So just going through that ongoing, here's what could potentially look like. And if somebody finds something and, and it's a potential breach, we're required to share it with the group so that everybody knows, hey, they, they tried to get in this window, let's close that, but let's make sure they don't get in the other one. So I suggest to everybody, hey, don't think it can't happen to you. And if it does happen to you, jump on it like right away. So as you can see, small business owners such as yourself could easily become vulnerable to said attack. Now we're not trying to focus on the scare tactic. We're really just trying to stress that you spent so much of your time, effort and money into building value that we want to protect it. So what are we going to do from here? So we actually want to talk to the business owners themselves. So I know we're limited a little on time. So we're going to try to keep to about 10 minutes per business owner. And with that said, please ask questions in the chat box and we will answer them as we go through each client. So let's start with Karen. Karen, are you there? I am here. Good. Great. Good afternoon. Karen, yes. from your perspective, and we obviously saw your story in the video, you know, can you tell us what you've learned through this experience and maybe perhaps some nuggets of advice that we could pass along to the audience in your case? You know, it, it, it's odd because you think that you, you, you think you're being cautious. You think that you have processes in place um, and you realize that for every strategy that you employ, that the cooks out there are, are, are coming up with other and more creative ways of, of separating you from your money. And, and it's sad, it's really sad. Um, you know, I had to make sure that the things that I saw um, in, in, in identifying some of the, the emails that were spam or phishing, that I needed to share that. It couldn't just be, oh, I saw it and I found it and I didn't get you know, taken advantage of for that case, I had to make sure that I showed those examples to my team and also to my family. You know, family members are, you know, some, sometimes they're working and, and it could be a personal thing. Um, and putting in other processes. So I, you know, we even now require our team to go through some of the same um, cyber training that our, like we have staff in the field at government installations. So for every installation they go to, when they get on a contract, they have to go through required cyber training. Yep. Um, our office doesn't have access to military information, but the people that work in that internal office are now required to do that same training because they need to know what is, what is, what is out there. Um, and you think you know. So the SBA um, sent out a, a little mini uh, cyber quiz and it was interesting because it gave you specific examples or samples of emails. And it said, okay, this guy sent you an email. It looks like this, it says this, whatever. And it, you had to say whether it was legit or not. And I got 67%. And that was after I knew or thought I knew what I was doing. Um, so it's always an ever uh, changing process. And, and I'm telling you, these things look legitimate. One of the ways that I discovered that this guy was not legit. The email came in and it, it was dot.gov. Um, but when you looked at it on my phone, and I don't know if y'all have ever seen this kind of thing before, I'll see if I can show it to you. On your phone, you can look at an email that comes in and then you can tap on the name from which it came and the actual email itself will open up. So like if you see, I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but you can tap on the name and, and their actual email will come up. And that's when I saw it was his name, but there were extra alphabet in there. So instead of just dot.gov, it was his name um, at us.dot.dot.us.dot.dot. So it was duplication or extra stuff. And when you're a small business owner, you don't always have time to look at the integral weedy things. So, but you have to take that time now. Yeah, certainly, Colonel. I'd like to call you in here as a first panelist, considering we've been talking about the topic of uh, government contracting. What is your assessment of uh, Karen's situation? So I, I think she's spot on. I mean, one of the things you've got to do is maintain a healthy level of skepticism uh, and, and awareness. You've got to be observant. And if it looks out of place, it's probably out of place. Um, and, and 
maintaining that level of curiosity about your own sources. If anything smells funny, um, it's worth your extra 30 seconds to dig into it just a little bit. Now, the trick is, how do you as a, a general user of small business, this is not your primary function in life. How do you build the skills to do that? You know, how to look at the true uh, source email address rather than the label, uh, things like that. Those are skills I think worth talking about. I think uh, Brent, part of your plan or Earl for this community is to, to have some seminars where we build those skill sets. Um, and you've got to maintain that skepticism. Certainly. We also had a question come in from the chat from Dennis. He asked, instead of changing passwords every 90 days, is it just as effective to use a password manager such as one password? So uh, I saw that one pop up and I made some notes and, and my concern is, is pretty simple. They're effective. They, they keep you organized. It makes your life more convenient. They're typically encrypted on your machine. However, a rule of thumb you can apply is increased convenience typically means a decrease in security. So if you've got a security manager that's maintaining all of your passwords and one of the business owners indicated they had witnessed a time where their computer was hijacked and the, the mouse was moving on its own. Well, if I've hijacked your computer and I'm impersonating you, odds are extremely good. I can just simply open up that password manager and get access to the keys to your kingdom. So I would avoid that at all costs. To kind of follow up on, you know, Karen was talking about obviously training her employees further. How can a small business owner make their employees take cybersecurity more seriously? Though? Because it doesn't just affect the owner. I mean, it affects the entire organization. You know, that's one of the things we talked about back in June. And it's probably the hardest uh, thing to consider for any organization, small or large. You've got to have a reasonable training plan where you, you educate to the basics for every employee that touches anything. And so with that, you've got to also inspect it. You're the boss. So you control kind of what they're paying attention to because you control their employment. Um, you can tie bonuses, incentives to it. You can tie uh, punitive measures to it. It's however you do it, but make it a requirement. To kind of touch on that a bit too, because you know, Karen's always talked about redesigning the way they approach cybersecurity. So let's say they consult a cybersecurity expert, but they're unsure of where to start. What would you look for in said expert? Uh, in terms of the expert, yeah. I would say someone who understands the basics, someone who can communicate the basics to you. You're a small business, you may or may not be an IT related firm. Uh, and I would say you need a consultant that you can trust. And, and that's going to take some common sense and their ability to assess your organization. Can, can they see you clearly and help you see you clearly and then communicate to you what you need to be better? I like that answer. So we've, we're asking for any additional questions. The only thing that popped up additionally in the chat was a phishing quiz from Google. So it sounded like something similar to the SBA quiz, you know, testing, you know, how well can you distinguish between a legitimate email and those scams? Yeah. It, every time I get handed a link for anything, my radar goes off. Did you say, there you go right there. So, so do so at your own risk. Um, yeah. yeah. Be careful. Uh, that's a fair point. Well, Karen, do you have any last words you want to follow up on with the Colonel's responses or assessment of your situation? No, I really appreciate the feedback and, and we'll keep trekking along. And if, of course, if, I love the SBDC, so I've always been attached to them. They, they've been my rock since 2012. Uh, I showed people I used to carry Scott Bellows a card with me so I could share his card with other small businesses. But I do appreciate all that you guys are doing to help us small businesses maintain and grow and prosper and stay safe. Well, thank you so much, Karen. So if I'm not mistaken, Jody Lynch is our next client that we want to talk to. Jody was featured in the video. Jody, are you on the call? Jody? It appears that Jody is not with us for the call for the moment. Um, she was featured in the video. However, with that said, I do know Aaron is on the call. Aaron, are you there? I am. Great, Aaron. Similar to Karen's situation, I was curious to hear your thoughts 
from, I know you had a multitude of issues you talked about and we used your quote, you know, the cheapest is probably not the best way to ensure cybersecurity for your business. Would you like to elaborate on the thoughts that you described in said video? Um, well, one thing I'll say is uh, most people are using multiple devices and everything that you do for your computer, you need to be doing for your phone. Um, I had actually gotten my phone hacked is how I believe that um, mine started because they were actually getting my access codes that were being texted to my phone. Um, I guess, uh, like I said, it's just everything you're going to have to put, you know, your malware programs, your uh, uh, bit defenders, your Kaspersky Sky, or some sort of uh, protection on your all of your devices. Certainly. Now, as we did similar to Karen's situation, we'd like to bring an additional panelist on. And Scott, I would be curious to hear your assessment of this situation. Well, I think as the Colonel noted, just doing some very basic um, cyber hygiene up front uh, can prevent a lot of these hacks. Um, I'm amazed um, having to come in and look at some of the small businesses that have had these typical uh, situations of a, of a ransomware or um, sending money uh, just by a, an email, uh, just simple phone verification before you move, whether it's a dollar or $10,000, pick up the phone and call the individual that sent you that email and confirm it or send a text to them, uh, anything other than just, um, you know, sending that, that cash without verifying it. Um, another thing is just, uh, and again, I think the Colonel noted this is, is the links. Um, even if you get an email that looks like it's from UPS or Amazon and you're expecting a package, it's super easy just to click that little box that says, you know, check on status. Um, just go to their website directly and not click on the link itself because we trace back probably over 50% of malware that gets downloaded to the computer that, um, you know, has situations like Aaron's going through where they you know, lock down your systems. It, it gets populated on the computer by someone clicking on a link and that uh, malware gets uh, on the computer. And lastly, the, the thing that we're also um, continue to be amazed about, and this goes back to the response about the password manager, is we typically see a breach um, happen where the bad guys, if you will, are in your system for up to 90 to 120 days. So they're monitoring what you're doing. They're watching. They're looking for the best opportunity. They'll wait to see. You know, maybe you're communicating with a with a client, or as uh, as we've noted, sometimes you're not the target. It's a bigger company that they're trying to get into, and they'll notice you know that you're communicating maybe with a big vendor, and there's a big purchase order coming in, and they'll strike at that time. So um, again, just just. Be, uh, be prepared. And last thing I'll say, and then again, I have a, a little bit of a vested interest just from the standpoint is I've, I'm a big proponent of cyber insurance is make sure you have a plan. And uh, that plan may be that you simply know what you're going to do and who you're going to call when you have a breach. If you have insurance, much like if you had fire insurance, you know to call your insurance agent, you know, at the, at the event to say, hey, here's what's happened and, you know, how can I recover from it? Um, unfortunately, we deal with a lot of small businesses that when these things happen, they feel like they're going to be able to call you know, local law enforcement or call the FBI. And, you know, they're just so overwhelmed, the frequencies of these things, that you're not going to get any help. You're going to be on your own. So um, with that, I'll, I'll take a break. <laughs> Hopefully that was helpful. Well, actually, I, I, you brought up a good point on the cyber insurance. I know we've touched on it briefly in the July session, but, you know, we've always heard of first and third party you know, cyber insurance. Could you distinguish between the two? And actually, could you tell us what, if a business say has first party cyber insurance, what does that actually cover in case of a breach? So the first party coverage um, will pay for, and uh, typically the insurance company will, will handle all of the initial response. So that's again, back to that plan that if you have an issue, then you pick up the phone and call. Uh, typically a 24-hour hotline to say, here's what's happened to me. And because the insurance company is financially responsible for that event, they come in and will recommend, you know, solutions. So they'll, they'll uh, try to get your systems back up. They'll respond with, you know, um, forensics to look at your systems to figure out what happened. Um, if you've got certain state or federal regulations where you have to notify the affected individuals, uh, there's a cost for that. So that's kind of the 
you know, the hard costs that you would spend to try to recover. Um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily where the big exposure is. The bigger exposure comes in in what is, uh, as you mentioned, Brent, third-party liability, which is things that happen much later after the breach, which is typically lawsuits, litigation, fines, and penalties. And uh, everyone from the FTC to states are now enforcing some of these fines and penalties, even on the small business owners, because they're trying to raise the awareness and make sure that people are taking the, the situation uh, seriously. The FTC's perspective on this is, is that if business A, regardless of size, takes steps to protect their data and business B doesn't spend the money and they have their data breached, they consider that unfair trade practices where the, the two businesses are not taking the same approach. And they're starting to levy you know, some pretty hefty fines and penalties against businesses for not taking this seriously. And the litigation from the, uh, on the, uh, those that are affected uh, in certain states, um, I'm, I'm in California right now, they have the ability to do class action lawsuits. So if for some reason you had 150 records, those 150 people can band together and sue you for uh, having their information potentially compromised. And the lawyers, um, I don't know if anybody's on the phone. Well, we do have a lawyer on the phone. Um, yes. there, there are practices uh, that are really beefing up their, uh, their, their, their data breach um, uh, practices, not only to defend their businesses, but to go after businesses and, and sue them for, for, for these breaches. So um, third-party insurance uh, will cover those expenses, meaning they'll, they'll, the insurance company should pay for a lawyer to defend you if you are sued and there was some kind of settlement, the insurance policy pays for that. If there was a regulatory fine or penalty, um, that is also covered. So to your point, we always recommend uh, when you buy cyber insurance to make sure you buy both first party liability and yeah. third party because there's there's two different exposures. There. And would you mind sharing probably what a typical premium a small business would pay for both of those? Yeah, so a good comprehensive policy, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report is it's not very expensive. I mean, it's a few hundred dollars. You could get a couple hundred thousand dollars of coverage, or you could get a million dollar policy for about $500 for a, for a small business. And it typically ramps up there. Um, but it's definitely worth every penny you pay if for no other reason to know who to call when you have a data breach. Certainly. So we had a, a, another question come in from Dennis. Um, this is so anybody in the panel could actually feel free to chime in. Is using a VPN helpful? And can you recommend specific antivirus and or malware software? Hey, I'll jump in and, and offer my thoughts on the VPN, but uh, as a representative of the government, I cannot recommend any, any <laughs> software. Um, a v, understand what a VPN does for you. A VPN either masks your uh, routing uh, from your home office or travel location, uh, and provide you a closed loop for your a virtual environment that establishes a perimeter or uh, masks where you're actually entering the internet from. Uh, if your VPN is establishing a perimeter for like a corporate VPN, for example, we use VPNs at work, then that perimeter, you're paying for a perimeter defense that's monitoring the traffic, monitoring the risks, monitoring what's going in and out. However, no matter what kind of VPN you're on, if your VPN allows you to go to dangerous spots on the web and out in the wild, you will then introduce that risk back into your network and operation. That makes sense. I'm curious, is anybody on the panel willing to throw out some specific options that they think are effective from the antivirus and or the malware protection? I will say that um, most of the small businesses that we work with uh, rely on the off-the-shelf programs, uh, some of the larger names, but maybe not quite as effective as some of the higher grade protections that are out there. I know um, Norton has a program that, that if you install their entire suite, you can turn off and on a VPN at will. Uh, you can install it on all of your devices uh, with, with, by simply forwarding the link to each of those devices. So I found that a very easy solution, probably not the most bulletproof uh, VPN out there, but uh, it is uh, an easy solution. And then uh, I know that some corporations and or larger organizations actually offer VPNs to their employees. So. If you are associated with any of these organizations, centers of education alike, 
and you're exchanging data with them, you might check to see what kind of VPN systems they make available to their vendors, suppliers, uh, clients, and the like. Ready to input. I think it's worth mentioning also that from a VPN perspective, if you're, if, if you're able to tunnel traffic from your machine to a destination, keep in mind that that destination also has the ability to tunnel traffic back to your machine. So if you're on a corporate VPN or one sponsored by any other company, then there's, there's a, a level of security that, that's assumed and probably legitimate. If you look at the public VPNs that, that would mask your, your source, where you're sourcing your traffic destined for the internet, there, there are always uh, articles indicating that the, those systems are compromised on a regular basis. Uh, NordVPN, for instance, is, is one, not, not that I recommend that, but it's one that yep. they'll have systems that are compromised from time to time. So you have to keep in mind that while you may be assuming that you're, you're protected because your, your source address is masked and you're showing up from Canada or from another country, if that particular VPN termination point is compromised, then, then your machine is, is now equally exposed to that attack. Good point. We had another question that popped up. Well, it's not directly tied in. It still goes back to getting people invested. And they asked, how do you encourage or convince upper management to be invested in cybersecurity? I think one of the, one of the things is to have the conversation. If, if you set down the top executives, whether it's two people or five people in a room and said, let's assume that every secret we have or every bit of customer data we have is exposed to anyone on the internet in a public forum. What impact is that going to have on the business? And you start there. It's, it's not a lot of people jump to and working with customers. They'll jump to the, the comp, the complicated solutions or they'll jump to, to a, a, a planned approach. But at the end of the day, it's what impact would that have on your business? And you, you can back into it from there. And if, if that doesn't motivate the, the business to, to evaluate a cybersecurity program, then at that point, it's, you know, that question is difficult to answer. But I think if you have that conversation about, you know, what, what would it do to us if we had X happen? That discussion typically will, will motivate the cybersecurity discussion. Certainly. Well, and also, also if, if you treat it like a fire, any kind of other disaster, it's going to have an impact on operations and that'll have an impact on your bottom line, right? Not to mention your reputation, et cetera. And so you, you have that conversation and you talk about continuity during the events, uh, identifying the problems as quickly as possible, getting help to recover and then remediate. So these are normal business continuity and de disaster recovery practices. But by doing so, you normalize cyber as any other kind of risk that will impact you. Then also, and I think maybe David mentioned or Scott mentioned it a minute ago, uh, you protect yourself against some liability if you're taking proactive measures. You lose data, you lose some of your confidential material, you're gonna face challenges from your European customers, if you have any of those, the, the GDPR, uh, the general data protection regulation in Europe will clean, you, clean your bank account out with fines. The California Data Protection Act, uh, NDA, uh, in any um, non-disclosure agreement that you have with customers, if you lose that data, you suddenly face a liability. Naturally. Great points. So let's actually move to another client for us. We do have Annie Richardson on the call. Annie, we're curious. We heard about your story in the video. I just wanted to hear your thoughts and the experience that you had, and what you've learned from said experience. Well, the one thing that I would say that I've learned is to continue to monitor and make sure you're always checking your systems. And it's not just the entry point, you know, like the computer where I saw someone um, using the corner to make a choice. But you always need to make sure that you are monitoring your systems, uh, all of your computer, your phone, and so forth. And that's one thing that I basically have learned is to stay vigilant. Um, and 
as far as your data is to make sure that you can keep it secure, find a way to make sure that is, because one of the things that I did find is that I lost documents. Um, so I had to find a way to make sure I could maintain my documents. And um, it's just always interesting to know that um, you can save them and you can have them on an off platform where if something should happen to them on your computer or your phone or whatever, you have them secure somewhere else. Um, so uh, what I did learn is to make sure that I was constantly monitoring my systems. If I saw something that did not look um, right or correct, I would follow it through with my internet provider or whoever to make sure that it's something that was valid because I got a lot of uh, non-valid information from that provider to say that um, your passwords need to be changed or something to that uh, point. So I was always constantly checking and making sure that um, the information is valid. Certainly. Now, Jim, we haven't heard you speak as the attorney on the call. I'm curious to see your assessment of everything that we've talked about. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a broad question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think that the, uh, the practical insight that our, uh, our clients have provided to us is really helpful. Uh, you do have to be vigilant. You do have to uh, keep an eye on the details. And uh, there's a, there was a question that came across, I think, in the chat about uh, if, you, if you do some of these things that have been suggested by our panelists uh, and you still get hacked, what, what does that do, that due diligence that you've done, do to help you uh, fend off legal actions? Well, that's a, that, the answer to that question is gonna take longer than we have to talk about, but the first thing that I'd say is uh, you do need to consider cyber insurance. Just like other kinds of insurance, that's the cheapest and can be the most effective way to help you in unanticipated situations. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of cyber insurance. I will tell you this as well to follow on the comments that were made about it. Uh, cyber insurance helps you by providing IT assistance, technical people that can come in and do forensic work to figure out where the problem came from, that is where the entrance was made, how they got into your system, how far they got into your system, what they've viewed or, or exfiltrated that is stolen and taken out. Um, and, uh, and, and they'll provide legal counsel for you as well, which doesn't necessarily help me uh, because you may not need an outside lawyer if you have sufficient counsel through your carrier, through your insurance company. But I, all, all that said, I think cyber insurance is, is a very important tool for taking care of the situation beforehand and afterwards. One other thing that I would say is that uh, pre-planning is critical. You don't just want to pick up the phone and call your insurance company when you see that there's a problem. Well, I, I think this really begins, and one of our, one of our uh, client stories uh, emphasize this, I think that this begins with keeping an eye on things and having your employees keep an eye on things. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the employees will see that there's something out of the ordinary before you, the owner, will see it. So uh, put in place an easy way for your employees to report suspicions. Maybe that's calling your cell phone number. I, I, I don't know. It would depend on the particular business. But you want to be careful with being notified by email, by company email, because honestly, one of the first things that hackers will do when they get in is disable or redirect those emails, either by rules, which uh, redirect emails with certain keywords in them, or else uh, totally redirecting your email. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm getting in the weeds and I didn't want to do that, but uh, those are my thoughts initially and happy to answer follow-ups. Certainly. 
Yeah, I guess here's one follow-up. You know, you're talking about employees being proactive, identifying suspicious activity and reporting it. However, you know, a weak point of a company could actually be the employee themselves. And so if you're trying to monitor employees, but you're worried about invasion of privacy, how might a business stay out of trouble, but still make sure that their employees are being, you know, proactive and being safe? You know, when it comes a, to yeah, Brent, that's a great question. Uh, you know, employment policies are really important in this realm. Uh, I suspect that many of the listeners today have some sort of policy manual. If they don't have an employee and, and company policy manual, they need to seriously consider that. And one of the policies that, that you would want to consider would be a, uh, a use of resource, company resource policy, and more specifically, uh, a, a use of electronic uh, devices and access. Uh, the point being to establish that you, there are authorized employees, there are unauthorized employees insofar as particular databases and so far as particular resources and assets go. And the point of that is to let the employees know where the fences are. And if they cross those fences without authorization, then the company can go after them under federal computer privacy laws and uh, under uh, many state uh, trade secret and data protection laws. So uh, having employment policies, I think, is also a, a critical part of the pre-planning phase. Certainly. Now, this might be kind of, you know, on the average small business owner's mind. The like, tell me what in your per opinion that the likelihood, say someone is hacked, right? And they have to try to recover damages. You know, they're saying, hey, I want to actually try to have the person who hacked me prosecute. What's the likelihood that actually succeeds for your small business? Uh, when you talk about prosecution, that to me uh, flags criminal prosecution. And, you know, the company really doesn't have any say in who gets prosecuted and who doesn't. They can certainly file a police report yeah. and, uh, and talk to the solicitor or the prosecutor's office and pursue, try to pursue charges. But it's really, uh, I think someone on the panel had mentioned how the FBI, SLED, uh, local law enforcement are overwhelmed with other and, and this is not pejorative, but other larger problems. And you're probably not going to get a satisfactory response from law enforcement, not because they don't care, but because they don't have the resources to put into your situation. So the, the prosecution side is a, it's a, uh, it's a stick that you can wave. I don't know how much contact you'll make with it. The other side of that though is civil action and civil action can be brought by the company under uh, trade secret and, uh, and data protection laws in the various states. And that can result in, uh, in monetary damages as well as injunctive relief. In addition to that, if you have proper employment policies, you can use those as another kind of a stick to, uh, to go after those who violate those policies. One final thing, and I, I meant to throw this out, depending on what source you look at, uh, it's estimated that between a quarter and a third of data breaches inside companies occur because of insider uh, action or, or, or bad acts on the inside, not, not somebody clicking on a, on a link in an email inadvertently, but somebody who intentionally set things up to allow theft of data. Certainly. Whether it's intentional or not, you know, let's say a business is hacked, you know, what are the first steps they need to do for actually reporting the cyber crime, perhaps like with their insurance company? Uh, you want me to take a stab at that, or Scott, maybe you want to talk I'm about it? Or more Carl? Me, but yes, I'm curious to see your perspective. Uh, my, my, my thought would be that if you've done the pre-planning, 
that I'm talking about, yep. you'll know exactly the roadmap to follow. Uh, and by pre-planning, I think Carl had referenced this uh, when he was commenting earlier, you need to have an incident response plan in place. That, what that means, it's a fancy word for a roadmap of how to respond if you or an employee notices something hinky is going on. Uh, so if you have that plan in place, that plan will tell you, I call A and here's the phone number, here's an alternate phone number, here's how I can text them, whatever. I call B, same information. I call C, same information. And I, then I do these other things. Uh, if you have that roadmap in place, you don't have to scramble around trying to find phone numbers and trying to think, well, who do I need to let know and, and how can I get help? Uh, I think your cyber insurance carrier is one of those first people that you call because they can get the IT professionals uh, who can help shut the valves off. Uh, I don't think you wait for to know who those IT professionals are until you have a problem though. Scott, maybe you can comment on this. I think that you need to know who the, who the insurance carrier has their, uh, has contract with as far as IT and forensic help and uh, have a little, do a little preparation so that somebody knows you and you're not having to educate people about your situation during a very critical time when data is being exfiltrated. Yeah. Scott, would you like to add on to that? No, I agree with everything you said. I think the key is uh, when, when you leave this session today, make the assumption that at some point in the future, your business will have to deal with this. And um, it should be viewed no different than any other risk that you face. It, it just is a business risk. I think some uh, executives and business owners feel like cyber is so complex and that it's you know something they can't get their arms around. But as a business owner, you know you have workers' compensation insurance in case your workers get hurt on the job. You have um, employment practices liability in case someone sues you for sexual harassment and slip and fall insurance on your work sites, et cetera. You need that same uh, type of, of coverage in place for this type of exposure. And you typically know who to call if someone gets hurt on the job. You know how to handle a worker's comp claim. Build the same kind of plan for what happens on, on cyber. So if you have insurance, I say call your insurance company first. Uh, the second person is I would call your attorney because I do believe that uh, there is exposure there and uh, your attorney should give you some counsel on uh, how best to deal with that. And in certain situations, that does also establish attorney-client privilege so that if you are uh, involved in litigation later, that uh, you have at least some um, a firewall in place about uh, how you handled it. That makes sense. Aaron, I know you posted a comment uh, talking about the FBI never responded to you. Would you like to actually tell the audience about that? Oh, Aaron, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, you have to respond through that special division on their website. And, uh, actually, we had contacted three different times because it was a, a, a large tier one contractor that we're dealing with. And of course, I had to have um, the reports filed for the uh, wire transfer, trying to get the insurance uh, claim. But uh, three different times that I filed through their updating the case with the FBI, never one time was contacted back. Yeah, it's uh, stressing kind of the points that we're making. So, yeah. Let's see. We had another question. I, I forgot to ask it. So, I, Dennis asked, I use an external hard drive taken off site for monthly backup. If I'm infected, will these backup files reinfect my cleaned up machine? Hey, so uh, Thanks. from my perspective, I, I think that's a matter of timing and how quickly you identify the breach. You know, if, if you have, uh, a 24 hour backup cycle and you don't figure out that you've been hit uh, for 48, 72 hours, then yes, uh, your backups are gonna be just as infected as any other. Uh, however, in the, in the case of a ransomware and the ransomware is triggered on your primary network, your backups may not have triggered the ransomware on them and you can still at least salvage your data. What I would recommend considering as a part of your plan is as uh, uh, Jim talked about, having a multi-tiered backup system. It's a little more complex. Remember, 
increase convenience is decrease in security and vice versa. Uh, but have a multi-tiered backup where you get a backup set A and then a backup set B, which gives you a little more runway to identify in time when you may have had a thought or a breach. Just my thoughts. I think one of the key one of the key points there as well is is if you're using an external hard drive to take data off site, how's the data getting to that drive? It's getting to that drive via a, a backup agent. Then the likelihood of the ransomware or the malware traversing that agent to, to compromise that data. It, again, it's a matter of timing, but assuming you've got a clean backup, if the backup, if that drive is just a shared drive or you're moving moving data directly from Windows, then you have much more uh, much more likelihood of that data being infected than if you're using an agent to move the data, like, like any, any backup agent. Um, there's hundreds out there, but you're, you're going to be more secure. And that typically lends itself to a multi-tiered backup option where it may be a cloud service or, or other external storage. Thank you. We had another question from Todd. He was mentioning a service called LifeLock, and he wanted to know your perspective on it versus cyber insurance. And it could be a chance that you may not be familiar with the service that he's mentioning, but. So from a, a layman's perspective, uh, I, I view LifeLock as a as personal protection, whereas cyber insurance would be either protection for the business or protection for, for the customers or covering some liability that the business can be exposed to where LifeLock is gonna cover more personal liability but beyond that i'm not sure if lifelock has other expended options yeah, I, I would add to that and say that you know lifelock really is meant to be one of those services that you know, it, it gives you notification that you've been found on the radar so to speak so you at that point you've probably been hacked you probably had a breach and you're now on the list of victims where insurance is more of a protection uh, and an infrastructure to help you recover from now being on that list of victims. So it's really kind of two different services, I, I would say. Certainly. I was trying to think of some other questions we might throw the team's way. Mm, Here's I one. Uh, I know it may, we may have already addressed it, but if you had to give a final thought from each of your perspectives, what would you define as the single most important thing about cybersecurity? If you only had to take one aspect to get to a small business owner, what would that one aspect be? You know, from my perspective, I would say, and this is something we talked about back in June, is as a business owner, uh, where it is your livelihood, take the time to understand what information you have in your system uh, and what value it has. That allows you to be at least informed about prioritizing its protection. If you don't understand what's floating along in your networks and your associated networks like phones and social media, et cetera, uh, then you're just, it, it's kind of the ostrich protection plan. Your head is in the sand. David, what was the one thing that you would give to a potential small business owner? Just know that know that you are at risk, uh, regardless. And I, I heard it mentioned earlier in the in the in the meeting that just just because you don't you don't think what you do is is that visible or that important to someone, I, I can guarantee you that it is. So know that you are at risk of of a security incident or breach. And, and at that point, assess the risk of, of what that means to you or your business. Uh, if, if it's ransomware and your, your files are locked or if it's, it's malware that destroys files, you know, what, what does that mean? And, and take a pragmatic approach. It doesn't have to be an overly complex or overly expensive system because if you don't, if you don't have the user education or the basics, the blocking and tackling covered, then you're probably not gonna be effective regardless of how much money you spend. So just a pragmatic approach, user education, and then having a list of contacts, just a very basic plan, starting with who to call in and what order. If you recognize something that, that you perceive or that's been confirmed as a security incident, just knowing, knowing where to start and, and letting the professionals that do this for a living 
guide you through the process of either either recovery, mitigating further damage, uh, responding to the event, or from a, a PR perspective, if, if it is public, you know, managing managing the reputation or the potential impact to your reputation as a result. Thank you. And Jim, I'll let you wrap this up for what is your one thought or take? Well, yeah, that, this is easy because Carl and David already summed it all up. I, I agree with those two gentlemen. Pre-plan, know what you have, know how to protect it and, and do the basic stuff before you try to get too fancy and, and miss out on the foundational uh, protection. Thank you, Jim. So Earl, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you have some additional information that you want to share based on SBDC. Sure. And one thing I, I would also add is, you know, as a small business, you may be one person, you may be multiple people. You have to make this a change at the cultural level. This is not a checklist item. This is not just part of something you do once in a while. Culturally, you have to change the way in which you do business, the way in which you monitor things. Um, you know, a lot of our small businesses are used to the remote model. They, they've worked with people that are all over the United States and all over the globe, so to speak. Um, so they're used to working remotely and having people in different places and sharing data across wide networks and so on. But there again, some of our small businesses are not and uh, a lot of things are not in place to protect them in these uh, new ways of doing business and their culture has not changed to accommodate that either. So uh, just make sure that you're, you're aware of the fact that this isn't just a checkbox item. This is something that changes the way that you do business is, as a whole. So, all right, Sarah, could we um, get to the next slide, please? So uh, it was asked in the chat box here just a moment ago, uh, so how do I get, get in front of this, uh, the, this assessment thing and, and get that taken care of? So that's great news. We've at least reached one person today. <laughs> so uh, the uh, situation that you have right now, some of the things we'd like you to do next, of course, is reach out to the SDSBDC network. If you have a primary consultant right now that you're working with, uh, all of our consultants have been briefed on this program that is being rolled out, and uh, they will be more than happy to work with you and, and get you in contact with one of the cybersecurity uh, uh, small business development center team. Uh, and so reach out to them. If you do not have a primary uh, SCSBDC consultant, uh, we're going to have contact information on the last slide here in just a few moments where you can reach out to Brent or myself and we'll be happy to get you in touch with the right team member if it's not one of us. Uh, some of the things that we have available to our clients, uh, we have the Small Business uh, Cybersecurity Guide and Training Workbook. That's uh, meant to be kind of a, a, an all-encompassing tour guide through the 17 different uh, controls that the CMMC model offers for basic cyber hygiene. Now, that may have sounded like a lot of Greek to most people, but basically what it means is these are steps that you can take to protect that value built into your business that are fairly uh, easy to implement. Most, uh, I'd say probably 90% of them are process oriented. So this is, in, is not something you have to throw a lot of money at. These are just things that you have to simply say, wow, I'm not, I'm not doing it right. I'm not making the right steps here. I, I should do it this way rather than that way, or I should lock that door when I leave or so on. They're, they're, they're very basic uh, guidelines. So that workbook is available. We can sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, do a self-assessment, ask you some of the questions maybe that you heard in today's presentation, uh, maybe that you haven't thought of as a business owner, because you know what? You're doing business. You, you're doing things that you do to make money, and cybersecurity has been secondary to this point. So we can help you address some of the things maybe that you need to look a little bit deeper in with regards to cybersecurity. It's pretty simple. It's a two-page document. Not only are we assessing, but we're also helping you gather some of the planning elements that you've heard many of the panelists talk about. You know, who should I call? What kind of questions should I have the answers to? Where are my backups? Those kinds of things are on this assessment. So uh, we can help you pull that together. 
And then as we develop our program, we're going to be putting more and more information out on our website, the scsbdc.com website. We will have, you know, common terms, glossaries, FAQs, uh, links to other resources, and of course to our SCSBDC team. So check that out on a regular basis as well. Uh, next slide. And some of the resources that will be added to that site, and this might be a really good time for you to do a screenshot or pull out the phone and snap a picture. Uh, these are some of the primary sites that we have used to pull together a lot of the information that we uh, have in our programming, uh, primarily focusing on the CMMC and the NIST models that are out there that you saw earlier in the presentation. Uh, and eventually we will be putting out a schedule of training classes that you can attend to get a little bit deeper into the weeds on some of the, the actual topics that we talked about and also the 17 steps of CMMC. So be watching out for that on our scsbdc.com website as well. So uh, with that, I think uh, Brent and Sarah, we're uh, at the, the closing slide where we can take um, questions. And, and there's our contact info. Brent, back to you. Thanks, Earl. And I wanted to re stress once again that this may be a unique service and a new thing that we're doing but all of our services, a consulting matter, are always no cost. So it's just something additional that you get when you sign up as a client. All you got to do is go to scspdc.com, see a blue box up at the top right, sign up to request counseling. It's as simple as that. It takes five minutes and we'll get you going. I'd ask my panelist here, you know, what was the one thing to take away? And I think Earl touched on it beautifully. Value. You've spent so much time creating the value, cultivating it. Why not protect it? Okay. Remember, this is not requiring you to be a cyber expert. It is simply taking the time and effort to ensure that you have testable measures, that you have the basic cyber hygiene, because so much of what we do is based on the continued value that companies offer. So we wanna make sure that you're continuously putting that out there, servicing the economy and helping everyone grow. And with that said, if you have any additional questions, please let us know, you can get my contact I'm easily by email. I'll get back to you hopefully within 24 hours. I know Earl will do the same. So we hope to hear from each one of you. Please take this to value. We look forward to future sessions. With that said, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.